you for joining us this evening. We will begin with roll call. All members are present. Thank you, Mrs. Browning. And Mrs. Niles is going to lead us in the pledge. So if you would please rise and join us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First on the agenda this evening, we have consent. Make it a motion to approve consent. So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? Great. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Next, we have our first and only discussion item. And I will just point out, we don't typically have discussion at our workshops. But this was brought to us, and the policy committee has a recommendation. So we'll go with our first reading. Pam. Okay. Um, <coughs> policy committee got together we had a recommendation from our um, general counsel to put this into place it will be policy 0211 called non fraternization and this policy is being proposed for the board to consider tonight its first reading um, it is important that boundaries be established regarding personal relationships among employees for those reasons stated within the policy Well, thank you very much, Mrs. Niles. Any questions for Pam or Lynn, who also serves on the policy committee? Okay. Well, yes, go ahead. Uh, I guess the only the question I have is when will it come back for approval or for the discussion? March 26. And I believe we have two others to bring back on the 26th as well. Yes. And they're all located on the Google Drive. And they were presented at the February 26th meeting. Thank you, Mrs. Niles. Great. Moving right along, we have our workshop topic, and to that, we're going to look to Dr. Dudley. Thank you, and good evening. So this evening, we have part two of our elementary program evaluation, and we will be um, looking more at the our service delivery model that we have for um, our high ability students. Um, and just as, as a reminder, as far as program evaluation, um, we have um, conducted we conduct program evaluation for many of all of our curriculum areas um, on a six-year rotating basis. And then we also look at um, larger program evaluations, like for example, we did middle school program evaluation um, several years ago and restructured that. And then for the last year and a half, we've been working on elementary program evaluation um, and looking at these are the recommendations that we're bringing to the board. So as far as um, looking at that program evaluation, um, we have committees that work together that look at research, then they also look at um, stakeholder feedback, um, and then also our current practices as well. And so we want to um, take those and say, what are those next steps? What are those best practices um, defined by research? And that's where the recommendations come from. Um, and so that's, we'll be sharing those recommendations. We'll continue to share those recommendations as we did at our last meeting, and then we'll delve deeper into it tonight. So this evening, I would like to introduce, we have several people that will be here working with us on the workshop. Um, we have Dr. Martha McFarland, the Director of Curriculum Instruction and Assessment here at ESC. We have Mrs. Mary Podney, Supervisor of Learning here at ESC. We have Mrs. Betsy Howard, an Instructional Coach at West Clay Elementary. We have Mrs. Sarah All, a teacher at Prairie Trace Elementary. We have Mrs. Heather Ertel, a teacher at Cherry Tree Elementary. We have Mr. Ryan King, a teacher at West Clay Elementary. We have Mrs. Julie Arnold, a teacher at Forestdale Elementary. And we have Mrs. Jill Shipp as well, a principal at Prairie Trace. And they will be helping us with our learning this evening um, in a little bit. But I'd first like to turn it over to Dr. McFarland. So thank you for this opportunity this evening. As Dr. Dudley said, this is part two of our elementary program evaluation presentation. So when we were here last month, we talked about elementary program evaluation and four subcommittees and recommendations in four areas. So high ability programming, special education, continuum of services, wellness programming, and then innovation in the elementary school. So this is an area I know of intense interest, and so we want to focus the entire evening on 
the work of the uh, high ability programming subcommittee. So in order to fully understand that, we need to wind back to um, the K-12 high ability program evaluation. And that committee met, convened, and conducted its program evaluation in the years 2015 through 2016. And that uh, program evaluation uh, yielded several recommendations, priority recommendations, and actually we have talked about those and those were presented a couple of years ago here. Um, but I want to draw your attention to four recommendations that came out of that process, and these are four recommendations that have a direct bearing on elementary programming. So the first one is that the district refine identification and placement procedures in accordance with Indiana Code and India, Indiana Department of Education guidelines. And we'll talk a little bit more about those in just a minute. The committee then recommended that the district investigate and or expand program delivery options at the elementary and middle levels in English language arts to increase differentiation and high ability learning opportunities. Then the committee recommended that the district look into developing options for K-8 high ability science and social studies programming. And finally, that the district institute programming and supports at all levels to address the social and emotional needs of high ability learners. So given those recommendations, we got to work right away on the first one, which was refining identification and placement procedures in accordance with Indiana Code and Indiana Department of Education guidelines. Now here's what Indiana Code says about high ability learners, and it defines high ability learners. And you can read what's on the screen here. Basically, Indiana Code said that, says that high ability learners are those learners who demonstrate high achievement or high ability. Notice the word or and not the word and. And so, in looking at those provisions in the uh, definitions in the law, the Department of Education told the district that we were not in compliance with what the law required. Now, the law had not changed, but the Department of Education was more closely monitoring um, districts identification procedures and so not only Carmel but many districts surrounding districts had not been following what the law required of us in terms of identification of students so now we were looking at achievement or ability instead of achievement and ability and so you um, can understand how that predictably changed the number of students that we identified for high ability services so the district revised its identification procedures and processes so that we would be in compliance. Now this is posted on the district website, the High Ability webpage, so you can access this there. It's described in our High Ability Handbook. But what we do now is have a two-phase consideration process. So basically what we do in phase one is our universal screening for achievement, which occurs at first grade and then we continue to, to monitor students' achievement, and we look at student achievement based on NWEA testing, and we look for the 98th percentile in English language arts, and the 90, no, 98th percentile, excuse me, for math as well, taking into account the standard error of the measure for identifying students who are high achieving and therefore high ability learners according to the state's criteria. Then, what we do is have a phase two consideration, and in that part of our process, we look at ability. So we will administer COGAT um, assessments to look at verbal ability for students. And then we also look at qualitative factors, and we use various assessments. We gather input from teachers, from parents, so that we're looking holistically at students. Because we have some students who may not achieve at a certain level, that demonstrate the characteristics and quality, qualities of giftedness. Those could be English learners, they could be twice exceptional learners, learners who just develop me, developmentally aren't quite there yet. And so we're looking multidimensionally at students in order to be able to identify them. Now, as we said, predictably our numbers, as we were looking at those criteria, criteria our numbers went up. So, here you see 2015 to 16, 16 to 17, and the current school year. And so you'll see the number of 
newly identified students second through fourth grade and you can see that predictably we have more students identified early and in second grade for high ability services and then in third grade over time um, and in fourth grade and fifth grade we see those numbers drop although during the 2016 to 17 school year we also identified more students and you see in that middle bar that there were more students identified at each of those grade levels for high ability services and again remember this is based on criteria from the state what's in Indiana code that tells us that identifies what a gifted or a high ability learner is so uh, overall numbers of high ability students in our district you can see from the 2015-16 school year where our students who were placed were based on achievement or ability and then moving into 2016 to 17 where we had the achieve excuse me achievement and ability in 2015-16 then we moved to the or criteria so 2016 to 17 was achievement or ability and then in 2017 again we're at achievement or ability so you can see how the numbers have gone up based on what we were required to do under Indiana code now we did engage some consultants high ability consultants in the state of Indiana to uh, two women who are widely known for their expertise in high ability programming they have their own high ability consulting uh, business they also work with Ball State University and with the Department of Education to look at our data to help us to make sure that we were aligned in terms of identification procedures but also to make sure that our programming aligned with what the research said and in essence they told us we have a very elegant problem in the Carmel Clay schools we are a high-performing district, therefore very blessed to have many high-performing students in the district. So it's really upon us to make sure we're meeting the needs of all of our high-performing students in addition to all of our students. So you see the numbers have gone up. We have this elegant problem on our hands. So how are we going to serve our students with equity and parity? make sure that we're not compromising for our high ability learners that make sure that we're providing evidence-based practices and services for all students in the district so the Department of Education was not finished yet so they made sure that we were in alignment with what the code said but they also said that we should cast a broad net using local or national norms whichever are more inclusive and because we are a high performing district local norms are less inclusive than national norms norms for Carmel Clay schools so in essence using national norms which is what we use on our NWEA assessment then we were asked to take into account the standard error of the measure which we do refraining from strict cutoff placement criteria so we're looking holistically at students and we're looking at a variety of um, qualitative and quantitative data measures to determine who our students are and then finally we were told to avoid a one-size-fits-all identification process and or program design in essence the DOE is telling us that we need to be responsive to the needs of the students that we have and in our district that's what we intend to do so a little more data for you so if you look at on the, the pie chart on the left hand side overall in grades two through five in our district you can see that we have 11 percent of our students who are free and reduced lunch now we would expect the number of students who are identified for high ability uh, services to fall somewhere close to that 11 percent you can see that four percent of our students currently are identified as high ability students from that group of students of low socioeconomic stat status and so that's a statistic that we want to keep our eyes on we want to make sure that we are using multiple measures to identify the students who are entitled to high ability services to make sure we're being responsive to their needs then we also look at the um, ethnic and racial composition of our students so grades two through five overall you can see these are the uh, classifications that the Department of Education asks us to report out on so you can see the makeup of our student population overall and then you can see how that 
uh, is reflected in our high ability programming. The one thing we want to do in casting that broad net to make sure that we are inclusive, that we are serving all of our students appropriately, we want to make sure as we look at our data and we look at our demographics in the entire student population, we want to make sure that as closely as possible that's reflected in our minority populations as well. And so in, in this particular case, we would keep our eyes on our black, Hispanic, uh, and Hispanic students. We might also look at some disproportionality in our white students who identify as white and then our Asian students. So these are all demographics. This is important data that we like to keep our eyes on. We want to make sure, once again, that our programs reflect parity and equity in terms of who we are identifying for high ability services and in the services that we are offering. Okay, so moving past our identification procedures, then we knew we needed to look at the three remaining recommendations. So looking at elementary program design, because we knew our numbers would increase once we were aligned with what the Department of Education required. We also knew that we were going to look into options for science and social studies to meet our high ability learners' needs, and then look at the programs and supports that are so important for all students, but uniquely important for high ability learners who have their very own constellation of social and emotional needs. So, you see our elementary um, program evaluation, the four components of it in that diagram, but you also see then how the K-12 high ability program evaluation fed into that. So we have two different committees who recommended that the district look at programming for elementary high ability students. So that's how we got here. Now, let's look at the work of the elementary uh, program evaluation and subcommittee strand focused on high ability and many of the teachers and administrators here tonight were members of that subcommittee. So as we talked last time, you know that we use a process of interest-based problem solving as we engage in the program evaluation process and as part of interest-based problem solving, we pull out the shared interests of those who are sitting on the subcommittee and the shared interests become very, very important because they serve as a lens for the recommendations once those are made. So I want to draw your attention to the first, rec uh, first interest on the screen, and it's a very important, a very important sentiment from our subcommittee. Shared responsibility and ownership for all students. So while the people at the table represented high ability services, had amazing veteran high ability teachers at the table who are advocating for high ability students, who thoroughly understand the needs of high ability students and want to make sure that our services are as responsive as possible. They also wore the dual hat of being concerned about the well-being and the services we provide to all students in our schools. And I think that's a very important sentiment. It's very characteristic of the way we do things in Carmel Place schools. So it's a shared ownership. We care about all of our students. And that was very, very true with this uh, subcommittee's work. So we want to um, embed that focus on high ability students within the fabric of the school and provide high ability students the benefits of a learning environment that was rich with connections to the general ed environment, but also maintained the integrity of high ability programming for our students. In essence, we want it all for our students. And I think you'll see that play out tonight. So we wanted the program's second interest to be responsive to specific needs of students. So it needs to be, for our high ability learners, appropriately complex with opportunities for acceleration, differentiation, and flexibility so we can benefit our high ability learners. And the research on the model that the committee subcommittee recommended shows that when you have this program in place, it does benefit all learners in the school because it leads those practices within the entire school. Evidence-based practices for one group of students will benefit other students as well. So, the committee looked at the research and one of the things that pops right out is the fact that grouping high ability students is an evidence-based practice. 
just as in special education we have the least restrictive environment, which is an inclusive environment for our learners, for high ability students the least restrictive environment is placement with other high ability learners. So they need to be grouped together. So the subcommittee felt very strongly that our students be grouped in clusters so that they would have intellectual peers to interact with during their school day. So two pieces from the research, full-time grouping of high ability students results in substantial positive academic effects in addition to smaller yet positive gains in social ma maturity, self-efficacy, and motivation. And you'll recall back to the charge from the larger K-12 program evaluation committee where we were given the charge of looking at social emotional well-being and programming for our high ability students. Grouping has that impact on students when students have access to their typical peers. So then we looked at various models for grouping and full-time grouping within schools. And one of the models that is, very, that is well, uh, well supported by the research is the total school cluster grouping model. So it is a full-time grouping option. We did not want part-time placement for any students. It's full-time, provides high ability learners the dual benefit of access to intellectual peers and other grade level peers within a rich and diverse context that promotes both academic and social and emotional growth. Again, we want it all for our high ability learners and that's what this model is designed to do. A quote from the research, and the uh, primary researcher on this is Marcia Gentry, who is a professor at Purdue University. She's written extensively on this, and it really is her life's work. Total school cluster grouping is a specific research-based total school application of cluster grouping. This model is unique in that it considers the strengths and needs of all students within a grade level, including high ability learners and places them in classrooms yearly in order to reduce the range of achievement levels in each classroom. This in turn increases opportunities for differentiation of curriculum and instruction for all students resulting in increased student achievement school wide. And that goes back to that shared interest from the subcommittee of shared ownership and care and concern for all students. So here is their first recommendation that the district refine the existing program delivery model to more closely align with the total school cluster grouping model. So, in four steps, identify, identify grade level sections for high ability clusters with high ability students grouped together into one or more sections by grade level. Where needed to balance enrollments by section, cluster general education students into classrooms with high ability students according to flexible criteria always seeking the best fit for the classroom and the overall grade level. Do not simply identify the next tier of high performing students for clustering. Cluster decisions are made by the principal with input from teachers and other professional staff. And then balance all other grade level sections with students from a range of achievement levels and educational needs with the goal of minimizing the range of differentiation required for any given teacher in order to best meet, meet student needs. A few additional recommendations. Utilize opportunities for flexible grouping within grade level teams to best meet high ability student needs in English language, language arts, math, science, and social studies. And use data and other criteria flexibly throughout the year according to task, content, and context to avoid tracking students into static placements. Use flexible grouping options to expand opportunities for social emotional learning for all students. So within this flexible grouping option, students are afforded opportunities for uh, rigorous science and social uh, uh, learning within their grade level. Um, there are many opportunities, things that could occur that involve such rigorous experiences as problem-based learning, genius hours, uh, open inquiry, student-directed inquiry, and research. So we can extend that into social studies and science. Uh, number three here, identify materials from existing curricula and adoption so that teachers have what they need to teach and to differentiate to meet students' needs. Provide opportunities for collaboration among general ed, special education, high ability teachers 
the Indiana Association for Gifted Education and the National Association for Gifted Educators have position papers on this. Strong, strong statements of the value of collaboration among all staff to support high ability learner needs. And then finally, to provide professional development to support ongoing growth of teachers who are veteran high ability teachers, those new to the high ability arena, to make sure our teachers know and understand the nature of giftedness, that they know and understand compacting, acceleration, enrichment, um, task complexity, the many things that go into providing appropriate education for our high ability students. So those are the recommendations that came from subcommittee members. All right, now we're going to put it into practice and let you see how this works. Okay, so um, the way it works in the building level is that each building, um, student data will be reviewed annually with current teachers and professional staff. And so that professional staff might be um, the student services coordinator focusing kind of on that social emotional piece. It might be the school psychologist, it might be the special education team. Um, it could be, you know, reading intervention, but they're looking at all student data at each grade level uh, with the teachers who have now at this point, it happens each spring, and so at this point they've known these students and know them as learners for an entire school year. Some of the things that they're looking at, classroom performance, social emotional well-being, environmental factors, um, an overall picture of learning strengths and needs, and then obviously the academic achievement uh, goes into that as well. Students are then grouped according to qualitative and quantitative uh, factors to make sure that it's truly the best fit for them. And then using flexible criteria and multiple data points to ensure that um, all students, including high ability learners, have the best environment for learning and continued growth um, in an academic setting. So what this might look like, um, for a grade level that has five sections, so there's five classrooms at this particular grade level, uh, you can see that there are um, 46 identified high ability learners or high achieving learners at this particular school. There are 32 students whose academic achievement is um, above average, and then 31 average students, three low average, and three students that are performing in the lower range and um, need additional supports in order to access the curriculum. Within those numbers, there are also four students who are identified special education students. So these are students that have um, an IEP to help them access the curriculum in the grade level. <clears throat> the first thing teachers will do is they'll look at those 46 students and they will um, group them into, in this example, they're grouping them into three different groups. So within those 46 high ability students, they're really looking at the social emotional quality, um, needs of the groups of students. They're looking very specifically, obviously, even though 40, all 46 of them are high achieving, there's still a range um, within those 46. And so they're able to group very intentionally um, to make sure that these students have intellectual peers with them throughout the day. The next thing the teachers will do is to intent very intentionally place the students with special needs um, to make sure that it is a best fit, a good environment for them, and to make sure that the additional supports that are put into the classrooms are able to meet the needs of the students in that classroom. And then, um, as mentioned earlier, one of the goals of this program is to make it so that no classroom has more than three achievement levels. Um, and so in this particular example, uh, with the goal of wanting to have balanced classes by the end of 23, the three classrooms that have high ability learners have um, only two levels. So they have average and high achieving students in their class. Then you take um, for the next classroom, there are no high achieving students. And so we want to have those above average students in those two classrooms to ensure that we do still have above average students that can act as uh, academic models when it comes to showing some higher level thinking, um, that are asking deeper questions. Um, and, and so those students then are grouped in, or split, those 32 students are split into the remaining two classrooms. <clears throat> um, the goal is also to try and have average learners in every single classroom 
So you'll notice then the remaining eight average students have split between these two classrooms. And again, each of the classrooms has only two or three achievement levels. The next example is might be a smaller school. Um, so it only has four sections. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, there are 24 identified high ability or high achieving students, 26 above average, uh, 24 average, 13 low average, and eight low. And then within that, um, six of them are identified. Six of those students have uh, an IEP and have been identified for special education. Again, the team is going to look intentionally at that group of high achieving students and divide them into two groups this time, um, so that there are two in each of or two equal groups in each of those two classrooms. And then they're going to look at the average students again, making sure to look at social emotional needs. And these might be things um, about, you know, students, as we look at this too, it might be students that work really well together in terms of collaboration and um, that, that social emotional piece. It also might be those students who maybe shouldn't work together, or sh who shouldn't be in a classroom together. And so we now have two different classrooms where we can um, put those students. <coughs> And then um, our special education students, again, if you look, um, four of them are in the low ach achievement range, and then two of them are average learners. And so they are um, put as part of that six of average, just to make sure that we're intentional about where, where those students are placed, because again, supports are put into the classrooms that have special needs students. And then we look in this example for class A, we have uh, three different levels, so there are six average and then seven low average students. Class B might, with six average and six low average. Class C has um, above average, again we go back to that above average, and then average learners and low achieving, and then the same thing for class D. Uh, this model, um, this teacher here is Lexi Ripple, and she is a uh, third grade teacher at Mohawk. And Martha spoke a lot about flexible grouping and how that can be used to support uh, all learners. And Mohawk has had the opportunity this year to build that in a lot, especially in their third grade. <clears throat> one of the things that they notice because they are one of our smaller schools, when uh, their third grade classrooms, they have two high ability classrooms and two general education classrooms and the gender, um, the numbers were off in terms of gender. So our high ability classrooms were very heavy with female students and, and our general education classrooms were higher with male students. And so when you think about access to peers and a social emotional um, needs, there were um, some concerns that for both the girls in the general education classrooms, they didn't have access to as many peers and then also then for the boys that were in the high ability classrooms and so um, third grade at Mohawk has worked a lot on flexible opportunity grouping opportunities throughout the year that they plan together as a grade level with their uh, coach as well as their administrators so Lexi's going to talk a little bit about how flexible grouping has benefited her students hi my name is Lexi Ripple and I teach third grade at Mohawk Trails Flexible grouping has given our students opportunities to collaborate with all of their grade level peers. So far this year, we've gone on a field trip as a whole entire grade level, and upon returning, students collaborated to create a Google slideshow highlighting their individual learning. Other activities include team building and math games. Flexible grouping has supported our students with their social emotional learning. For example, I found that flexible grouping not only promotes a positive classroom atmosphere, but it also enhances our grade level community. Because of flexible grouping, there has been an increase in positive relationships that have formed between students and teachers. Flexible grouping has given me the opportunity to collaborate with all my grade level teachers and with our instructional coach. We have worked together to plan and facilitate all flexible grouping activities. This is a, a video clip from Laura Sarwanka, and she is a second grade high, um, teacher at Orchard Park. And Orchard Park, just based on the numbers that they had in their second grade, decided to go ahead and try 
the school uh, total school cluster grouping at the second grade level. Um, so basically, the um, what happened was they had too many students to make a just one class, but they did not have quite enough students to uh, justify two classes, and so. Uh, the principal there decided that she would split them into two classes and they would cluster average achievement students into those, class, that, those two classrooms as well. And so uh, Laura is going to talk a little bit about differentiation and how that model has benefited her students. Differentiation naturally occurs in the workshop setting, where students are given the opportunity for research, inquiry, and choice, where students can take charge of their own learning. Cluster classrooms provide a more balanced environment, more similar to the real world with varying personalities and abilities. Students are encouraged to appreciate each other's individual talents and differences. This diversity results in some amazing classroom discussions with a wide range of opinions and perspectives. I've been encouraged by this model because of the way it empowers students, how well they support one another, and how well they work as a team. Thank you for coming down and thank you for participating in this activity this evening. Um, we are going to have you or ask that you put your teacher hats on tonight as we take you on a, a, a learning activity. And what we're trying to do is show you a potential model that we might do with our high ability teachers as a professional development opportunity uh, next year. So with that in mind, think about how this could also be used with teachers. And so we've put you in a ability clusters. You have a expert in your group that has learned about the total school cluster group model through um, the, work, the work that we did on the committee. And then we have some ex unexperienced people who will be learning as we go. Um, and so I want you to keep in mind that just as our grade level Indiana academic standards drive our classroom instruction, tonight we are going to be using a standard from the National Association for Gifted Education, and that revolves around standard three, curriculum planning and instruction. And so I'll read that for you since some of you can't see very well. But it says, educators apply the theory and research based models of curriculum and instruction related to students with gifts and talents and respond to their needs by planning, selecting, adapting and creating culturally relevant curriculum and by using a repertoire of evidence-based instructional strategies to ensure specific student outcomes. So that's the standard that's driving our activity this evening. And then your learning targets for tonight are with a learning partner, I can study the case history of a person who as an adult has made a significant contrib contribution to American society. I can use the information provided to better understand how giftedness impacted this person's childhood and lastly, I can reflect upon this person's learning experiences to better understand the potential of the total school cluster grouping model and being responsive to, responsive to the needs of high ability learners. Um, so the task at hand is in front of you and what you'll be doing tonight is with your processing partners, um, you will have a profile of a student 
Now the student that you're going to be reading about is a, a pseudonym, so you're not going to really know who the student is. You're going to read about them. Everybody on your team is going to read the same information about the same student. And then you have task cards in front of you. There are five task cards, and you have a little uh, template that shows you the blacked out number for your task, and that's the one card that you're going to choose. Once you've chosen your task card, read about your student, and worked at, with your team to answer the task question, then we're going to go around the table and we're going to share out our thinking. And then there's going to be a couple questions that are listed in bullets at the bottom of your white um, half slip of paper. And we're going to have a, a debrief. And then we're going to read and learn about your, uh, the person and who they really are in real life. We're going to do this for three different people. And then at the end, we're going to come back together and have another debrief. And what questions might you have about this task? All right, well, so in a high ability classroom, we would want to lead with a big question or a big idea, a big concept, because our high ability learners are hold apart thinkers, and so we like to start broad. And so for you, our big idea tonight is high ability students benefit from a service delivery option that facilitates authentic differentiation and nurtures continuous growth and personal development. And then we always have essential questions that go along with that. The essential questions um, not only act as a stimulus for cognitive development, but they also provide a vehicle um, to learn the subject matter. And so tonight, the, your subject matter happens to be total school cluster grouping. Um, so with that being said, we are going to let you start on your uh, first task. I don't
I appreciate the the active discussion I'm hearing. I was just saying to Martha that this feels so unnatural because if this was a classroom experience, I would be over there coaching in, listening in, pulling out ideas, and this is kind of un, unnatural for me. So I want to talk about the group processing, and, and first let's go around and talk about our task. So who had task number one? Can you guys share a little bit about what you came up with for that? Should I read it? Task, task one is share three interesting facts about the student's childhood. Okay, so our task, our task was um, to share three interesting facts about Nathan. And so um, we actually shared many interesting facts. One was that he, um, he had a passion for inventing, that he seems to learn through talking. Um, he was um, actually born in an electrical storm, which was interesting, and then he can, all, he can be heard talking throughout the evening, right, all to himself, and that his um, senses are very acute. So that was more than three. Or ever achievers. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And then task two is create a Twitter hashtag that captures one or more of the students' unique personality traits. It <laughs> is online, though, funny. That's what I do for my job. <laughs> <laughs> so it's going to be amazing. <laughs> um, so one of the things, uh, where is this at? I'll talk loud. Is it on? Okay. So we love the fact that he loves weather and he's fascinated by it and he, the lightning storm is really wonderful birth story, but the, how he loves inventing things and um, learning all about that. So I did imagination sensation. So the fact that he loves, isn't that good? Told you that's good. Great. <laughs> so um, the fact that he uses his imagination and he wants to touch things and he wants to learn about things and he wants to ask questions and he loves thinking out loud. So and to me he is sensational. Um, it talks about how his IQ is over 150, that's quantitative, that's great but also there is other qualitative 
aspects about him that we looked at too that didn't truly really the situation. So there Perfect. you go. No, nope, thank you. So task three, in what ways did family or home environment impact the student's childhood experience? So I've got to follow that, huh? <laughs> um, so I guess and my cohorts can jump in. I mean, we, from family experience, we thought that he has a very diverse um, parents and diverse learning experience, um, very hands-on, um, encouraged to do that kind of thing in the house. And as growing up, and I guess we were a little concerned that if he's going into kindergarten, how he would fit that way of learning into the more structure that um, he would face as as a kindergartner. Great, thank you. Task four: If you could interview this person to better understand the challenges he or she faced as a high ability student, what questions might you ask? Uh, we the first one we would ask would be, how do you feel? when others are confused by your behaviors. Uh, the good. second one would be, what opportunities do you, did you have during elementary school to utilize your imagination and creativity? And the third would be, how did you feel about the day-to-day -day school work as well as the additional uh, spatial area classes? Great questions. Um, task five, what might a classroom teacher have observed about this student that would indicate potential as a high ability learner? Well, I guess if she had looked at his information, his IQ was quite high. So okay. it's not that common that our students are 150, so that's really fabulous for him. But um, our particular student is highly creative and imaginative. Mm -hmm. And um, his ability to conceptualize his ideas at such a young age and um, just to make things and develop things was really interesting to us. Um, his, he's just extremely sensitive to his surroundings as well as his his senses in general his sense of touch his sense of you know his hearing his it's just um, just an exceptional little young man exactly nice job before we move to the group processing what I'd like to do is point out that you're working on differentiated tasks so the task cards from one to five get progressively harder so if you had task one the first time around fantastic um, the next one you're gonna get is gonna challenge you a little bit more but this kind of activity is perfect for a high ability classroom, it, especially with the total school cluster grouping model, because it allows all students to participate in a supportive environment and have access with peers to different um, varies, varying difficulties of task. So please let's take a couple minutes and, and talk through these two questions for our group processing. So the first is, considering all of the information and the insights that you've shared about this student, discuss the educational programming and learning opportunities that might best address his or her unique high ability academic and social needs. And you can speak into the microphone and just kind of popcorn around the table at your, at, as you want. Well, I would think he'd like, we would like to group him in, um, in cohorts with peers that are very similar mm -hmm. um, because I think he would get very frustrated quite easily when he's trying to express himself when people don't understand him. So peers that are like-minded I think would be absolutely necessity. Thank you. Anything else? I think, you know, thinking of the way he seems to learn where he's talking through um, experiments, that the, the teacher will need to understand that he probably um, processes and learns through talking, through mm. verbal interaction. So a classroom that is, okay, everybody go work quietly <laughs> may not be the best place for him. Um, and, and not saying that you wouldn't have to do that sometimes, but a teacher that needs, that understands that, that he probably does learn through that verbal communication. Absolutely. And that goes back to what was said earlier about being very intentional and looking at the whole grade level and not just a small group of kids when we are placing students in this model so that we are cognizant of those social emotional needs and those learning needs that make one classroom setting better than another. Absolutely. Does anyone else have something they'd like to share? And we can go on to the second question. Mary? Um, I think a classroom where the teacher is building in opportunities for him to um, use his imagination and creativity so hands-on inquiry-based project-based learning are going to keep him engaged in the content and um, allow him also opportunities to pursue his, his passions. Great. 
Yep, oh, thank you. So our second question, in what ways does total school cluster grouping offer a, program, a programmatic framework for addressing those needs? I kind of said one already, but <laughs> yeah. I think just the planning and the discussion aspect. The fact that these people who care about these kids are going to talk and see what best the things that these children need. What are, just like all the examples that you guys gave, that they make sure that they place him in an atmosphere that's not just a computer randomly sticking him in a classroom. Mm -hmm. It's people who care about him, who are making sure that he's in a place that he can thrive and be successful. Absolutely, that's a really great point. Anything else? Okay, well this is the fun part. We are going to tell you who Nathan Kassan really is. And he is Nikola Tesla. He never built a prototype, but he designed and imaged his invention, his invention is in his head. As an adult, he designed the alternating current motor and sold his patents to George Westinghouse. Tesla also developed the design for the first radio, but Guglielmo Marsoni was credited with the invention, claiming he was unfamiliar with Tesla's work. 20 years later, Tesla sued Marconi and won. He is now credited with being the real inventor of the radio. So that's Nathan. That, that, that was a great hashtag. All right, so I'm going to let you now go to your second um, colored sheet of paper. So it's your second person, and you'll have a new task card this time around. So look for uh, student number two, and look for the blacked out, air, blacked out area, and then that's the task you'll be focusing on for the student. Yeah, but even though her IQ might not show that, because so right. 
there's a lot of practice. But I think it would be useful in this first language. We have those conferences to teach us about learning, listening, or speak about what we're going to listen to or come up with these creative stories. Yeah, but the problem is that the tests are given in English. So, how do you feel like a child? How do you feel for a kid? And it's through those conversations and the bonding with the teacher that you're going to find. Even though they're smart and they're doing really well, they're not very good. Well, so that's what I was going to say. And there's books. Yeah. There is no one to do. So that would be hard for child school. 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 That would be hard for child school.
shows some indication that she has a long attention span. Um, she has an enjoyment for learning. Um, she has early and rapid learning, and she's creative and imaginative. Those are all character would be characteristics of 5G. Absolutely. So when we go to our group processing task, and you consider all of the information that you just shared with each other, um, what are the educational programming and learning opportunities that might best address her unique high ability academic and social needs? One thing, um, I don't think anyone talked about it, but it said that one of her um, goals, where, where is it at, that she wanted to be, clo um, where is it at? She, she wanted to be closer to like her peers. She wanted, mm -hmm. to, be, she, she, her, she wanted to be like her friends. And so um, one of the opportunities, so I think she's a very social child. She wants to be around other people. She wants to, so, and then as far as being like her peers, that sometimes that's a really, really great thing. And then sometimes also that can cause problems too, depending on peers that she wants to be around. So I think that is definitely like a great conversation for the teachers and the parents and everything to have. Okay. I think that point is a really good segue into the second question. So in what ways does total school cluster grouping offer pragmatic um, framework for addressing those needs? Well, I, go ahead. Okay. I think one of the grouping options here could be since that her goal, one of her goals is to becoming, making friends with mm -hmm. American peers. So maybe pairing her with, um, put her in a class that was more outgoing mm -hmm. you know, students and that way will make her easier fitting into the environment. Absolutely. Anything else? I was going to say with the total school clustering, if she's considered one of the average, not the identified, and she was clustered in with those high achieving kids, yes. there's a very good chance that she could rise to that Absolutely. same level based on her exposure to those peers and being more social. Absolutely. Being exposed to the way they think. Heather? And as mentioned, there will be so many options for reading and writing with all yep. of the curriculum being in all of the classrooms where teachers can take and use what they need to mm -hmm. to best meet the needs of all their students. Yes. I think she'll really benefit from the very rich literature right. that can be pulled into Absolutely. So you really touched on the social emotional aspect and giving her access to peers that she can relate to and grow and learn from, as well as the academic aspect of um, being in a class if she was at her IQ level, which I think they said was 95, that she would be considered maybe in the average cluster, but in a high ability clustered room, she could grow and rise, rise to that occasion because we know she's got that ability, she just hasn't. Um, had anybody to nurture it at that level. So time for the reveal. Katie Lou is Amy Tan. So Amy Tan and her siblings did deal with significant amounts of parental pressure for academic success. As an adult, Amy dropped out of her pre-med classes at San Jose City College and focused instead on English and linguistics. She became a successful business writer, but later found greater fulfillment in writing fiction. Her first book, The Joy Luck Club, was an international bestseller, and she continues to be one of America's most popular novelists and one of the first Asian American women to achieve this status. Yeah. I have a comment here. I think that in our current identification criteria, mm -hmm. Katie here in the example could very well be identified as a high ability student. Now, the her, I know that first of all, we are not just evaluating a student as a high ability just based on IQ test or achievement test. And also her IQ here at 95 is simply because of the difficulties here in her language. That's, that's so, absolutely, absolutely yeah. true. So hopefully she's in a class with a teacher who would recommend or recognize her gifts and then ask for that kind of data review and use her classroom data and her personal experience for the whole school year as opposed to one test which was given in a language that wasn't the student's first language and be identified. Absolutely. I agree. Okay. Yep. Okay. So time for your last uh, profile. So you can go to the third color paper and look at your task card, which should be different again for your group.
Okay, let's go with our in three interesting facts about David Collins. Okay, so um, we said that David's a middle child in a family that's very involved in the community. Mm -hmm. We think that plays into some of our other interesting facts. Um, he's very interested in debate and concerned with social injustice. And we also found it interesting that he was expelled from first grade, but it was just because he was not the right age when they in, um, tried to enroll him in first grade. Okay, thank you. And the Twitter hashtag? Um, because he was expelled, and um, he has all of these very <laughs> things that you know show that he is gifted, we said education without limitation. Right. That nothing should hold the child back from school if he truly needs to be learning in the environment. Absolutely, so. that's a great one. Um, the family home environment, test three. Is this good? <laughs> <laughs> oh, look at me, like, I'm so good. She's judging. <laughs> um, so we asked what ways did his family home environment impact him. Um, I love that we are learning about the whole child. Now, when a child's in kindergarten, first or second grade, you may not know all this kind of stuff, but as a child gets older in school, especially if they stay in the same school, I love the mm -hmm. fact that the teachers can learn about their things. So this child, um, his, he has a stay-at-home mom. And his father is a minister, so we thought that was um, that had maybe something to do with the social causes and empathy. He sounds like a sweet soul, just one of those kids who really is just tender-hearted and really doesn't want anything. You know, has a keen sense of justice. Um, he talks about how his parents are supportive but not overprotective, um, which is something being he, we kind of called him stuck in the middle. He's, he didn't have a super. His IQ is unknown, but he, his teachers call him brilliant. He's not the oldest, he's not the youngest, but he really is just this middle child stereotype kid. Yeah, no, those are great insights. Um, in the interview, if you could ask a question, what would it be? Okay, I guess I have to go this time. <laughs> <laughs> um, we wanted to ask him about his relationship with his brother and sister, 
um, and his relationship with his siblings, uh, well, with peers and his siblings. Um, I would like to know what would be a good argument you might make on, on a particular topic. I'd like to know what would interest him. Um, and I also would like to know why he enjoys swimming. Because um, that, you know, maybe that's a place for him to think or to uh, do something other than all of this um, involvement that he's in. And I would be interested in finding out what his favorite song was because it might give some insight into who he is. Those are great questions and they kind of tie back to what Sarah said in our last round is that you really getting to know your student and making that personal connection is a great way for you to help that student grow and reach their potential. So those are great questions. What about task five? What might a classroom teacher have observed? All right, well, as, as task five, um, it was indicate potential as a high learner. Uh, since no more than three characteristics, we have three. Um, one would be uh, we focused in on complex arguments and explaining his thoughts. We thought that was one, one clue. Um, the second clue we thought was, well, he appears to be well-rounded um, because of all the extra activities besides just learning. Um, and then three was we thought it was interesting that um, he's concerned with social injustices in the world when he's eight years old. Okay, great. So considering all this information that you've shared with each other, let's go back and discuss the educational programming and learning opportunities that might best address his unique high ability academic and social needs. Who would like to share? I would say since he was good at debate and uh, has a um, heart for addressing social injustice, mm -hmm. And because his family is active, I would say give him some leadership roles, maybe in student organizations or whatever. Absolutely. For him to, you know, to really test his abilities. That's a great point. Anything Can else? Talk to you yeah. about how important it would be for um, a teacher to understand and appreciate his, um, oh, what should we say, his his abstract abstract thinking and questioning and not mistaken it for um, being argumentative. That's going to be critical for me. That's a really good point. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what you had? Is that what you said, Layla? <laughs> Anything else you want to share? OK. So in what ways does the total school cluster grouping offer a programmatic flame framework for addressing those needs? I just think, I mean, these are examples, but I mean, our kids are so amazing. Yeah. I mean, they're so different, and they have so many great skills and things, and the fact that we're even talking about all the things, I could get emotional, I'm not going to get emotional, that make these children exceptional is incredible. And I'm so excited that we are talking about it, and we're learning about the different ways to help them and everything, so that's all I'm going to say. So I'll start crying. Oh, yeah. thank so you. Like, yes, Heather. When I think of the total cluster grouping, I, I'm thinking of David and the other two students as well. That's something like a genius hour, yes. where they can pursue their what they are passionate about. Because all these three kids have been passionate about something, mm -hmm. um, but that would give them an outlet to pursue and really work at the level that they need to work at. Absolutely, that's a really good point. Anything else anybody'd like to share? You know, we just kind of tying on to that. Um, thinking about these three students together. Now mm -hmm. think about them in a group. One would be really working on the invention part of it. One in the group would bring the gifts of the storytelling, the writing part, and then this last student would bring the presentation of sharing what they've learned. I mean, so imagine how these, the group dynamics of these three kids working together and their gifts really working to put together a whole activity. Absolutely, really good point. So are you ready for the last reveal? Our David Collins is Martin Luther King Jr. So he attended segregated public schools in Georgia, graduating from high school at the age of 15. He received a BA degree in 1948 from Morehouse College and was later awarded a fellowship to attend graduate school at Boston University, where he received a doctorate at the age of 26. As a young child, Martin Luther King Jr. noticed the injustices in the world, and this led him to become a key figure in the civil rights movement. He was awarded a Nobel Peace Prize for his remarkable efforts, and at age 35 became the youngest man to have received the award. 
King was later assassinated for his beliefs, yet his legacy lives on as one of the nation's most influential civil rights leaders. So I am sure sitting in our classrooms today, we will have three or more incredible um, kids that will go on to do great things. And that's one of the things that makes me proud to work for Carmel Clay Schools and is really excited about um, the future of our high ability programming and the total school cluster grade model. Um, so that being said, I'm going to take us to our reflection. So we're going to talk about how this activity and the things that we discussed and um, some of the highlights. So for your activity with the task cards, all of the students were held to the same rigorous standard and learning targets. So you had differentiated tasks, but you were all working with the big idea, that big concept, and using those essential questions to narrow your focus and really expand your thinking and take it to a deeper level. Um, the activities were intentionally leveraged to uncover the big idea, guided by the essential questions. The process seam seamlessly integrated variable tasks and complexity. So as I said, task one was, you know, find three facts. That's kind of a lower level task. Uh, task two was creative, uh, create the hashtag for Twitter. And then task three, four, and five got in sequentially harder with inferencing and synthesizing what you've learned and um, pulled out from or what you gleaned from the little blurbs on your students. And then group processing at the end of each investigation provided a context for rich discussion, inclusive of a variety of ideas and viewpoints. And that's really um, a key point that I wanna highlight tonight because this kind of goes back to those two videos of the teachers who were talking about the social emotional learning needs of our kids and that this is, creates, this total school cluster grouping model creates a balanced environment which is more similar to the real world. It's uh, varied personalities, differing viewpoints. You have an opportunity to listen to kids from all spectrums of the learning continuum. And that is important as we go out into the world and we're creating young leaders that need to be able to work with all types of people. And so this model is great for that. We're teaching students to collaborate effectively and we're helping them learn how to build consensus and value the points of view of other students. Um, and then just a final thought is when you think about the three different profiles that you've discussed tonight, could a one size fits all programming model have identified these students for our high ability program? And I see some of you shaking your heads, but I believe the answer is no. So um, yeah, I think you're, so thank you. That was fun. Sorry. Get out of your way. Okay, before we close our presentation and then uh, address your questions, um, I just want to share this is a very powerful reflection from a master teacher among our high ability teacher ranks. Uh, she shared this with me even a couple of years ago, and it's something I keep. Uh, right at hand at my desk and I go back to it and I think about it frequently. So Carmel may have an antiquated definition and understanding of what a gifted child is and how a gifted child looks, acts, and grows. Personally, the biggest help for me was to change my attitude about the different types of gifted children and after that, the gaps seemed to close on their own. The whole social emotional piece is huge but a deeper understanding of twice exceptional children and evidence-based practices allows for all children to be successful. Um, very touching, and I think that sentiment sits at the heart of this incredible subcommittee of educators, many of whom are sitting here tonight, who worked very hard to design a program that will do the very best we can for our high ability learners and also will support the learning of all students in the building. So, what questions might you have? I know we have a number of questions. Um, first, let me begin with a huge thank you to the entire team that came. Um, the last workshop, as well as this workshop, really helped us dig deep and better understand what the program evaluation recommendations are and why they came about. Um, this was a really great workshop. Um, question I have, I'm sure, other people and parents have as well. I've had children go through the program and some not. Um, curriculum. 
it seemed to be a little different, and I know our curriculum has evolved, but what type of curriculum are we going to be using in the classroom? Um, how robust will it be? Are we using, what are we going to be using? Are we changing everything? Help me understand how this is going to look. So um, currently, the high ability curriculum is for English language arts is loosely organized around a curriculum map that's designed very much like what you saw tonight. So there are big ideas and essential questions. There are core materials that our high ability uh, learners use within that. And then there are uh, a range of additional supplemental materials that a teacher might use to address high ability learner needs. Um, within our program, we have evolved over the last couple of years to a workshop model. And this is not just high ability, but general education too. So a uh, pedagogical model that has a great deal of research uh, support for it. So we have, we use what we call the Lucy Calkins Writers Workshop. So our high ability um, learners are engaged in the Writers Workshop. And then this year we have made available to our high ability teachers the Calkins Readers Workshop materials as well. And so teachers have had the option of also engaging their students in this workshop model. And the workshop model is simply where students have received the benefit of targeted mini instruction that's aligned with standards. They have opportunities for uh, individual and small group application for individual goal setting and conferring with the teacher. Um, Mid-workshop teaching points, opportunities to share their uh, whatever it is they're reading or, or writing, and then celebrations and sharing at the end of the workshop. In just That's a broad overview of what that looks like. And then within the model, we have core texts um, designed for our high or selected for our high ability learners. And those texts are rigorous and um, engaging for our students. And then we have a variety of texts that students use in small book clubs. Um, they use in, they read individually. Uh, we have junior great books. We have simulations. We have some of the wonderful Indiana Department of Education simulations uh, or units that have been developed in some of the, well, the William and Mary units for high ability learners too. So there's a, a range of materials that are English language arts uh, that our teachers use in that area. So moving forward with our model, we want to support the workshop model wherever our high ability teachers are implementing that. Some are using this uh, Lucy Calkins model. Some use a more general workshop model for implementing. And we like to give teachers autonom autonomy to teach in the way that best meets their teaching style, but also the needs of their students. So we'll continue with that. All high ability teachers who will have high ability clusters will have access to all of the high ability materials. And then they will additionally have access to all of the general education materials too. And we have told them this is probably the only time in their lives when the district will say to you, you have access to anything you want. What do you want? And so they've all gotten a connection to a Google form where they are telling us exactly what they want, what quantities they want and um, beginning to think about how they'll uh, imagine using the materials to support their high ability students. We have also told them that we do not want to compromise anything for our high ability learners. Again, we want it all for our high ability learners. So we want the rigorous um, education that this district supports for high ability learners, but we also, also want to support their social and emotional well-being as well. Um, in terms of curriculum development, we are uh, beginning the work on frameworks going forward for our high ability teachers, so looking at standards and how those can be bundled. So we know that integration of content, science, social studies into the English language arts curriculum is a best practice, not just for high ability students, but for all students. So opportunities to bundle standards. Um, suggestions for big ideas and essential questions, and then suggestions for how to infuse the necessary rigor within their workshop model. So we'll draw on their expertise and what they're already doing with their curriculum materials. And then we'll look at some new practices too and offer suggestions on how that might look. For instance, we have at the middle level in our honors English courses, we have some t examples of teachers who are infusing problem-based learning 
within their workshop model. And we would love to see that as a practice at the elementary level. So we will uh, engage one of our supervisors, former department chair and honors English teacher, with us in that process to help us understand how we can um, infuse a problem-based learning scenario within our workshop model for high ability. And that's just one example. Heather mentioned uh, Genius Hour as another structure that we might look at and work on. So we want to offer uh, the range of materials. We want to provide some structure in our frameworks, but we want our teachers to have autonomy to do what they do best. They know and understand our high ability learners, and we want them to continue to do just that. We are not changing our math service delivery model. Uh, math is much more sequential, and so it really relies on mastery of certain concepts, skill development, standards of mathematical practice as students progress through the uh, mathematical, through the levels at the elementary level and into honors math, which takes them into middle school math. And so the model that we have is serving us very nicely based on what our data is telling us. Lots of opportunity for flexible grouping within the building. So buildings make decisions about placing those students year in and year out. And so we will continue with that model. And so far the Department of Education has said nothing to us about not meeting their demands. So we like what we're seeing and we'll continue with that. Yes. Um, well, grouping, grouped learning is not not happening right now. I mean, I have a fourth grader and I have a first grader, and even within English language arts, my, my daughter's in the orange group and there's a blue group and they're reading different novels and they're doing different things. I mean, so that is, grouping them by ability is happening already. Now, adding the high ability factor is different, but I mean, even within high ability classes, I'm assuming that they are challenged varying their skill set. Is that correct? There is a, a huge range of um, student needs within a high ability classroom or a high ability cluster. In many of our schools, we already have cluster classrooms. Um, it's rare to find a classroom that's uh, fully a high ability classroom. So within that range of students, high ability students, there, there are certainly different needs, not only just in terms of academic achievement, uh, their strengths and their areas of need, but also we know in terms of their levels of interest and their pursuits, their background, their language acquisition, so many different things that can play into uh, the range of needs for which we need to differentiate for our high ability learners. So yes, we do know that we need to group within even a high ability cluster. The one thing we never want to see is a static grouping arrangement. So once uh, an orange group student, always an orange group student, we know that practice is not supported by the research and doesn't serve our students well. Um, what about labels? So within your examples of how low ability, high ability, like right now with high ability, a parent will get in a letter that tells them they'll either be very excited to get one or they'll be very upset they didn't get one, depending on who it is. I mean, so we let the parents know that their child is, scores high ability, but as far as the other ones, I mean, besides the child's grades, how do they know or will they know? What's this going to look like in the future? So when students are identified as high ability, meet criteria for placement in high ability, then parents are notified that their student has been identified for high ability. Once identified for high ability, that student retains that um, tag, if you will, in the background in terms of data in the district. So once identified for high ability, always identified for high ability. Now, within the system, schools have leeway to group, to place students in the classrooms based on all this whole range of needs that we've talked about this evening. So you might be in this classroom or you might be in that classroom, but you're still a high ability learner. And the one thing that we want to ensure is as a high ability learner, you are with high ability peers. So you are placed in a cluster of students depending in the number of students, depending on how many students and the makeup of the, um, the grade level for that. So students do not lose, if you will, their high ability status. We're being responsive in terms of classroom placement and then that flexible grouping across a grade level, but they retain that, that identifier. And what about the non-high ability students? How are they, I mean, I saw how you distributed them, but how are they identified? Well, 
that would nothing would change from the way our students are placed right now. So at the end of every year, our principals, in conjunction with teachers and other professional staff in the building, work hard to make sure they have the most responsive placement, you know, possible for our students. And so, but once they place students, they don't we don't say, and you are a level three average student, or you know, we don't say you are a special needs learner, or you are, you know, we don't. We don't identify and tag students in that way um, with other unique characteristics. So, but they will be identified change. for high ability. Pardon me. But those of high ability still will be tagged. They must be tagged. That's a requirement by yeah. the state. Yes, they must be tagged, and we know we want to serve them in classrooms where we have clusters of high ability learners, where we have the best placement for their individual needs. Yes. Yes, I have a question. Um, in the past, when we had a self-contained high ability class, you had one classroom with the high ability students in it, or maybe more than one, with the other uh, levels heterogeneously grouped in your classroom, maybe five classrooms of third grade, like when I used to teach. Mm -hmm. um, what concerns me now is that the teachers who are part of the grade level now, let's say you have your five sections, now you have three high ability teachers and two other teachers. Will those other teachers ever have the opportunity to have high ability kids or will they be relegated to always having the low and the low average and the special needs kids? One thing with our professional development initiative, we want to make sure that that's open to and available to any teacher who wants to learn about high ability student, the nature of high ability students, and the pedagogy and practices that best meet the needs of our high ability learners. So we want teachers to be familiar, become familiar with, with these practices because as part of the research that supports the total school cluster grouping model, when you infuse the building with the pedagogy and practices of high ability learning, all students benefit. So we want to make sure all teachers have that opportunity to learn and to interact. Now those teachers who didn't have the cluster, maybe they will be working with high ability students if the grade level is doing a flexible grouping project across a grade level. So maybe you'll have a general education teacher who has, has a really intense interest in history and reenactments of of the Civil War. And so maybe you have some high ability students who will be placed with general ed students. They'll all be working at their own level, pursuing independent inquiry and research, but they're working with a teacher who has an intense interest and can guide that learning. So I would say teachers, it's never the intention that teachers get kind of pigeonholed into a certain role. And then the other part of the research that's very clear is the best teacher for a high ability student or for a high ability classroom is that teacher who wants to work with high ability learners. And so where you have a teacher who's interested in that, then we'll support that learning and that opportunity for that teacher. What about if all five of them have that interest? Will it be moved it, around? It, it's, a, it's a principal decision in a building, but certainly if teachers have the background uh, knowledge and understand the pedagogy, then decisions could be made about rotating, student, uh, rotating teachers. We even have that now with uh, where we loop in grade levels and where teachers change assignments, that kind of thing. So we would not discourage that. Again, we'd go back to wanting to have teachers who have had the training, the professional development, and really have the desire to work with our high ability students. Okay, well, I hope, hope that's the way it works. I also have concerns about the, the teacher here staffing for the uh, high ability program. So, for example, College of fourth grade currently has two high ability classes, and under the total classing model, it will increase to at least three if the same number, if we still have the same number of high ability students. So it's two from three, two to three, and I think the demand on the number of teachers and their professional development will be huge under this total classing model. I'm not sure about our current. Um, High ability, do we have that capacity to support the increased high ability classes? My other concern here is that, so now for teachers, they are teaching the clustering classes with um, 
which has high ability and uh, say average students. They have to attend to a significantly diverse student groups. So they will be addressing both <laughs> high ability and other students. Will that take away their attention from high ability students? I also think that my takeaway from tonight's the three profile here in the simulation is that I would say each kids here is high ability in some way. So they will be classified as high ability. And we can see their social emotion, emotional needs are different from say general ed students and also they would like more challenging environments. So in other words, the general ed classes will not fit them and they would like a very unique uh, environment. And I also want to share some of my professional experience. At IUPUI, I happen to teach the same accounting course to an honor section and to the general ed section. So the honor section has only honor students. The general ed has a mix of, you know, just general students and uh, a group of honor students because honor students are not required to take all honors. They have the flexibility to choose some hours in the honors program. What I observe here is that in the honor student in the honor section here, I can give my students a different textbook, give them different assignments because I know they, they are more motivated, they want more challenge. So their assignments here, their practices are more consistent and which apply universally to the whole class. And therefore, the learning environment in that class push them forward. And they work as a group. They're working really hard. While in my general ed class, those high, those honor students, they have the excuse of not working too hard because they know that there will be people behind them, below them. The performance will be below them. So I can I Can I just make one comment? for the parents that are here, please remember this is our meeting and don't, you know, we're, you're here as our guests um, and this is our discussion and, and we're at this point just listening to what a recommendation is um, and I think that there's worry out there that there's going to be a dramatic change um, and that's why you show up to one meeting. So please just keep that in mind and we're not going to address questions or answers because that's not this is a workshop for us, and I want you to understand that. All board meetings are public, so no one was invited. You're welcome to come in two weeks. You're welcome to come in four weeks. Um, so applause are not appropriate. So we have public participation, sir, at every regular business meeting, which is the fourth Monday of the month. You can send an email and ask questions as well to the board and or the assistant co-superintendents. But this is not the appropriate time. So I'm just sharing my experience and I think that my experience is kind of similar to what we are proposing here, what we are considering for next year. Um, um, where am I? Where am I? So I talk about that. I have two sections here. So I'm concerned here in this total classing model here, will we take away, I will, I'm concerned that high ability students may not get enough attention or full attention as they will have under the self-contained classes. And they also have unique social emotional needs that must be addressed in that small group instead of just in the general ed. So I'm concerned here about the teacher qualifications as well as do we really address the needs of our high ability students under this model. Okay, so I think there are a lot of embedded questions there, um, so I'm not sure I can recall everything that you asked, so maybe you need to uh, continue to dialogue with me to make sure that I'm well, able to, to, to capture everything. I'm just talking about my concerns. Okay. Do you want to ask any? These are my concerns. Right. But do you want to I don't think I receive, I mean, I don't want you to, I don't expect you to answer my questions right now. I don't think I receive enough information at this moment to think that the total classing model would be significantly better than what we are doing now. I don't think I have that information to show the advantages of this model. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions this evening? 
Martha and your team, thank you so very, very much. I know we have a number of questions that have been coming you know, to the board and we've redirected and have tried to answer those as well and, um, and we will continue to do so. We are very excited and encouraged um, to learn more about the recommendations and um, look forward to see how they will be implemented in the future. Thank you. So, and with that, thank you. Um, seeing that we have no other, no, oh, we don't, oh yeah, we do have another meeting. So okay. there's no meetings until spring break, but yes, oh, we yes, have, we do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do have one more on the, the 26th. And um, until then, meeting adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.